Okay, so uh, the last time we were talking about uh, thermodynamics, we did a little uh, review for some of you uh, who had thermochemistry in Chem 200. Um, essentially, we used this idea of delta H formation, which set all elements in their standard states in standard conditions, having a, a zero amount of heat energy needed to form them because they're already formed. And this gave us uh, something to base how much heat energy it would take to form all other compounds based off of this uh, zero point or the standard or standardization of the elements. Uh, so we use that idea along with Hess's law to uh, rationalize why an equation like this one here uh, would work for any reaction. <clears throat> so we have the delta H of any reaction can be found uh, for standard conditions, that's this signified by the superscript zero, as a summation of the delta H of formations of the products times their stoichiometric coefficients because these thermodynamic quantities like enthalpy um, are extensive and, and that means they're amount dependent. Uh, and then we would do the same for the reactants, delta H of formations, um, and sum them all up and then take the difference. And that would give us what we wanted, which is the delta H of the reaction. And we don't have to um, go to the lab and do this. Uh, and we also don't have to, in theory, calculate the total uh, heat content or energy content of any system uh, by doing this idea of delta H of formation. So we, we um, uh, gave arguments for the equation. Uh, then we showed how it could be used with values that you would find for delta H of formation in your textbook for any reaction. So we just picked out the combustion of propane here and uh, we wrote out our general equation again, and then we applied it uh, accordingly. So three times the delta H of formation of CO2 um, plus four times the delta formation of water. And also we have to remember from what we uh, talked about previously that uh, this quantity delta H as we'll find with other thermodynamic quantities are state functions. So we have to be careful about what state we look up our values for. So they're gonna have different delta H of formations for liquid water versus gaseous water or solid. So <clears throat> we have to make sure that we look up the right one. And according to this prescription, in your textbook, it should be about um, minus 285.8 kilojoules for liquid water. Now your textbook might be, that value might be different from online just a little bit or other um, textbook values because of the references or the sources that were used to uh, make these tables. Uh, so different research groups have slightly different values within their precision and uh, maybe averages were taken to make your table or whatever. <clears throat> but anyway, this is the application of that equation. We talked about its derivation uh, and, and that's uh, pretty much a, a decent review of the thermochemistry chapter. Then we went on last time to um, talk about why processes take place in our universe. Um, and we, um, we threw this one out about diamond, you know, how diamond, according to thermodynamics, uh, is favored to spontaneously uh, degrade to graphite. Um, and so 
there's these factors that we want to look at uh, and we'll be able to narrow it down to one main factor entropy um, and that's the, the one that we're going to focus on mostly and uh, use that to um, help us tell whether a reaction is favored uh, under certain conditions so you know what we're leading up to is um, a study of why processes take place under certain conditions. Now we know that diamond uh, is thermodynamically favored to uh, degrade to graphite, um, but it's not kinetically favored. I mean, it has a very high activation barrier and so it's gonna last for uh, lifetimes. And so we don't have to worry about this taking place quickly according to kinetics. Uh, and so what we're talking about also implies that there's some connection to equilibrium, the stuff that we just studied. And we wanna make that connection as well uh, in this chapter, because we know that diamond had to be produced. So there must have been some conditions which favored the production of diamond and that arrow would go the opposite direction. So we want to look at processes in this light and say, um, you know, what is equilibrium for certain conditions? Under conditions of extreme heat near the center of the earth and high pressures, equilibrium for carbon is closer to the diamond structure. Uh, but under conditions that we walk around in, in the world, everyday conditions, graphite is the one that's closer to equilibrium for uh, carbon. And so we can start thinking in terms of, of this already because we're gonna make connections later on to equilibrium and it shouldn't be that uh, far-fetched when we, we get to that point. All right, so uh, we introduced some terminology uh, and we talked about what it means to be thermodynamically spontaneous uh, as opposed to what we use that word for in everyday language uh, and also irreversibility. So real quickly, uh, spontaneous means that it's um, favored to take place on um, thermodynamic grounds, um, but it doesn't say anything about how quick it's going to take place. That's kinetics job. And irreversibility doesn't mean that you can't reverse that process. It just means that it's going to cost you more energy to reverse the process than you could have extracted from the process's naturally, natural flow uh, in the first place. Uh, any questions about that terminology? All right, so then we'll continue on with our review. Uh, we talked about, so, you know, what are the factors uh, that we look at in chemical reactions that tell us that that reaction is going to take place. And it's tempting to point out that many reactions uh, are accompanied by uh, a large release of heat energy. Okay, uh, so we're tempted to say, well, geez, all you have to look at is the exothermic reactions and, and they seem to be um, spontaneous, uh, another word to say spontaneous is product favored. So they're, they're heading towards products and you don't have to do anything about it. It's going to happen naturally. Um, and, and that would be an incomplete picture because here's an example of a spontaneous process that doesn't give off heat, but it absorbs heat. So we, we point that out uh, first because now we want to explain what's going on here. It's not just uh, heat in or heat out that leads us uh, towards predicting a spontaneous process. Uh, 
all right uh enter stage left entropy so there's more to the picture we introduce this thermodynamic quantity called entropy uh, given the symbol s and we define that as uh, energy dispersion or, or particle dispersion. So you take uh, a situation uh, where energy can be dispersed uh, into, say, degrees of freedom of, a, of an atom. Uh, and when that takes place, then entropy increases. So we kind of looked at this this thing entropy and and said that well under certain conditions then a process is predicted to be spontaneous but if you change those conditions then the opposite process could be spontaneous and, and we looked at that in terms of temperature so temperature at which a process takes place is important uh, and the connection to entropy um, is not quite evident yet, but there is a, a connection. So we explored that a little bit more. Uh, we, we got a handle on what entropy is uh, as far as recognizing it uh, around us. Uh, so we, we talked a little bit about uh, how entropy it, can be explained to be increasing in these processes uh, and also connected that to microstates of uh, matter. Then we backed up a bit and said, okay, let's use our uh, definition of entropy and talk about entropy content as far as liquid solids and gases are concerned. And uh, we saw that the entropy uh, would increase under these different conditions according to our definition. Uh, we then uh, looked at some further examples of entropy increasing uh, and the sign of entropy, the delta S, the change in entropy, uh, similar to what we looked at for delta H of a reaction. We're always comparing the final which is the products to the initial condition uh, of the reactants. And then uh, we can figure out whether entropy is increasing or decreasing as far as that reaction is concerned. So we uh, are introduced our definition and our idea of entropy to reactions. And that's what chemists are interested in our reactions. We uh, said, okay, well, in a, a molecule, you have certain places where energy can be distributed. And those places uh, we can't see, we call them microstates. And there's um, an incredible number of these in even the smallest systems. Um, and so this, quickly turns to a statistical uh, sort of an analysis. But in, in general chemistry, we don't go that far. They have whole courses in graduate school called statistical thermodynamics, which gets into this. Uh, so we kind of skate over that a little bit and, and you know, just do a, a light introduction on degrees of freedom and microstates. Uh, there's a lot more on it, so <laughs> you can go ahead and read it if you're interested in. Um, we can discuss, uh, but we don't get into it in general chem. So after that, we looked at how entropy might change um, with temperature, uh, with the complexity of a system, and uh, for solids. And so we discussed that last time and left off with this plate, which is an analysis of the entropy of a solid. And so here we have a, 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 an ionic compound of positive and negative atoms that are uh, attracted 
because oppositely charged particles are. And we see that that um, solid is dissolving. And so the last time uh, I asked you guys um, what's happening to the entropy of the solid, and someone says it's increasing. Uh, and so then I said, well, if the solid always, the entropy of a solid always increases uh, when it's dissolved, then why don't all solids dissolve? And I think we left off right there. So does anybody want to um, chime in there and, and tell me why they think uh, that uh, the reason for all solids not dissolving? Is anybody awake? Is it because of the KSP of the solid? Well, the KSP of the solid and the equilibrium constant, yeah, that, that comes into play. Um, but, and, and yes, it, it, it's definitely related to these thermodynamic quantities. And, and we're gonna get to that a little later on, but, um, I was hoping that somebody could break it down to simpler terms. Let's just look at the picture and, and see here. Now I have um, the solid and it's, it's arranged uh, negative, positive, negative, positive, and so forth. Um, and then if you look out here in the liquid, you see the same negatives and the positives uh, but they're a lot further apart. And so you conclude that the, um, the solid is more dispersed when it's dissolved. Okay, so, and you're correct, the entropy increases of the solid. But what are we ignoring in this holistic picture? In other words, what else is in there? Uh, the solids are not in contact with the water molecule. Yes, absolutely. The water. Check out the water. See, we have some water over here just, you know, all by itself. But now we have some water organizing or concentrating in very specific positions around the positive ion. And um, over here, we have a different orientation of the water that's around the negative ion, right? But it's definitely oriented. So what is happening to the entropy of the water? Let me ask that a different way. Is the entropy of the water increasing or decreasing? Could be decreasing. Yeah, it's decreasing. So there's got to be um, a whole universal picture of what happens in any process when entropy is involved, right? Uh, and so that's what this whole thing is alluding to. You have to to take a more holistic view of any process as far as entropy is created or destroyed. Now, we want to try to quantify uh, what entropy is, right? Uh, that's what we do in science. We try to quantify these um, uh, thermodynamic properties. So here's an equation that can help us uh, calculate the amount of entropy that we would expect uh, increases or decreases in a process. So this uh, entropy is said to be calculated with an equation that looks like an energy term, heat, uh, over temperature. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's the amount of heat that's needed to pump into a system so that system exists at this uh, particular temperature. Uh, so 
the change in entropy can be found equal to this for the system. And um, it's not any heat that we're going to use to define this. It's the reversible. So it's pretty much the minimum amount of heat needed because um, all processes are irreversible uh, as far as heat's concerned because you can't uh, guarantee that all the heat that you're putting into the process is going into that system. You're going to lose some. Let's face it, we lose it into the objects that's holding the, the uh, container, whether it's glass or metal. We lose heat into the atmosphere and it's gone. Uh, so this is a specific minimal amount of heat uh, needed. And um, we're gonna need to divide that by a temperature, but that temperature has to be constant, right? If that temperature is changing, then we're gonna need a more um, complicated equation maybe with derivatives where we sum over a temperature range. But this is general chem, so we're going to look at this um, equation, but it's really only applicable to uh, situations where uh, the temperature is constant or an isothermal type process. Now one of these isothermal type processes that we look at uh, are ch uh, changes in phase. So we know that the temperature at a, uh, a phase change is constant. In other words, I take ice and it's at minus 100 degrees uh, Celsius and I start pumping in heat and the temperature of that ice changes uh, until we get to zero degrees when it starts melting, right? And now that heat that goes into that melting ice um, is going to go into the uh, breaking of the intermolecular bonds and convert it from a solid into a liquid. So I'm pumping in more heat, more heat, but the temperature is not changing. The temperature is constant at that phase change until all the ice is melted and then it starts changing again until we get to the boiling point. And then at that phase transition, uh, a similar occurrence uh, takes place. So this, this equation, you have to watch out where you apply it. It has to be in isothermal conditions. But anyway, it helps us start to get used to calculating the change in the entropy of a system. Uh, for example, we have uh, this phase change of liquid to gas. Uh, we know how much energy is needed for this process per mole. This can be calculated using that equation that we introduced uh, when we first started our discussion today. Uh, for any reaction, you can look up those delta H of formations of the products minus the, the reactant and uh, calculate that delta H, which under constant uh, pressure conditions equals Q. So we can calculate uh, the delta S for this process using this simple equation. Uh, any questions on that? All right, now we, we jump to something that kind of looks un, uh, unrelated. So we went from the first law of thermodynamics, which is a conservation law, to the third law. We skipped the, the second, but we'll get to that uh, soon. The third law allows us to set our standard for entropy. Remember, we set our standard for enthalpy by assigning uh, all the elements in their standard states to have delta uh, H of formation of zero. For entropy, as opposed to enthalpy, uh, what's used is the third law of thermodynamics to set the zero. And what the third law says is that any perfect crystal at zero uh, degrees Kelvin is zero. And um, then entropy will increase as you add in heat. Uh, so 
The third law allows us to set the zero under these specific conditions, okay? Uh, then I, I just put this plate in uh, because this guy here, Frank Lambert, uh, helped to rewrite the general chemistry textbooks and their ideas on entropy, um, geez, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago. Um, so now uh, let's get back to this plate. Now, what the, the um, third law of thermodynamics allows us to do is set that standard of zero for perfect crystals at zero degrees and therefore calculate the delta S of any reaction uh, without having to go to lab. We can use these uh, standard uh, entropies that were um, experimentally determined uh, using this idea that Frank Lambert said, you know, it's not a complex idea, it's just the amount of heat that's needed to add to a substance to bring that substance up to the temperature so it can exist. Um, and so that's what these values uh, are and they are published in your textbook uh, and, and presumably they're obtained from um, uh, research groups around the world. So here you'll notice it looks very similar to that delta H of reaction except now we don't have this formation idea because we don't need it. We have the third law of thermo which sets our zero so you don't have any delta uh, S of formation, it's just absolute entropy values. And you always take the, the, the product entropy values, and they're also extensive functions. So you have to multiply by the stoichiometric coefficients in the balanced chemical equation, add them all up for the products, subtract the same for the reactants. And so you can calculate the change in the entropy for any reaction uh, using these published values. Uh, and, and here's an example of doing that. So now you, you have to be careful because before when we were calculating the delta H uh, for any reaction, uh, we couldn't find uh, like enthalpy of formation of H2 because it's zero and the same for O2, but unlike that for entropy and because of the third law of thermodynamics, these guys aren't zero. So they have values. So for entropy, if you look in the table, you're gonna find these values and there they are. That's for uh, hydrogen and this one is for the oxygen. Um, uh, no, I'm sorry. This one is for water, liquid water, two moles of liquid water. That's the product. Uh, this guy right here is for the hydrogen, two moles of, of hydrogen. And this is the amount of entropy for one mole of oxygen. And so when we sum up the, the products, there's only one. Uh, and subtract from that the, the reactants, we get a delta S under standard conditions uh, of this value for uh, the formation of water from its elements. Uh, any questions on that? All right, so I think you'll find it uh, pretty easy to calculate these for the problems. Uh, that you're going to need to solve for homework and uh, on the third exam. Uh, here, again, we go back and we look at uh, entropy as this idea of dispersion of energy and or matter, uh, which Einstein says is the same thing. Um, and so this leads us to the second law of thermodynamics which says that uh, any spontaneous process will um, 
have a delta s of the universe that's greater than zero. Okay, so for spontaneous and irreversible processes, delta s uh, has to increase. Okay, now <clears throat> the second law of thermodynamics says that the, the uh, change in the entropy of the universe is a sum of uh, all the parts. If you only assume that there's two parts, the one that you're focusing on, you call the system, all the other ones uh, go into the surroundings. Okay, so with this second law of thermodynamics, we now have a, an idea and a prescription for predicting uh, spont uh, spontaneity or, or processes which we believe will take place without external influence. They're just gonna happen. They're gonna happen naturally. And it's all embedded into this uh, second law of thermodynamics, which we want to uh, look at now in some detail and dissect and understand it. So when we apply it, we apply it appropriately. Uh, and it also goes back to that one uh, seemingly contradiction about uh, enthalpy, heat in or out. That's not going to point us towards spontaneity. The second law will. It's all entropy based. Uh, so now we see that even processes that absorb heat uh, are going to take place spontaneously. Now, how can we use that to understand in light of the second uh, law of thermodynamics um, why this process would be spontaneous? Uh, okay, let me ask you guys this question. I have ammonium nitrate solid on the left and I have ammonium nitrate aqueous on the right. Which has more entropy, the product or the reactant? Are you guys paying attention? <laughs> Which has more entropy, the solid uh, ammonium nitrate or the aqueous ammonium nitrate? You got a 50-50 chance. Just guess. Product. Anybody uh, disagree with that? Good, you shouldn't. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, yeah, that's the product, right? Because now you have uh, ammonium and nitrate floating around, uh, separated, there's dispersed. So you would say that the entropy here is greater than the, the reactant. So entropy is increasing, right? Um, where's this heat coming from, anybody? from the surrounding? Yeah, so um, if heat is coming from the surroundings and we kind of know how temperature affects entropy, right? Is the entropy of the surroundings increasing or decreasing in this process? Let me take it a step back. Um, is the temperature increasing or decreasing in the surroundings during this process? Uh, decreasing? Yeah, it's decreasing. It's getting cooler. So if the temperature is decreasing, what happens to the entropy? It's decreased? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it decreases. All right, so now you have a combined effect. The system entropy is increasing. The surrounding entropy is decreasing. But the process still takes place under these conditions, which is the conditions of um, uh, standard. 
all right? So which is greater, the entropy decrease of the surroundings or the entropy increase of the system? And how do you know? Can anybody put that together for us? Uh, okay, let me try to help you because there's a lot of things going on here. The process is spontaneous, which means the delta S of the universe has to be greater than zero. It has to be increasing. Therefore, the entropy that's created in this process from taking the solid to the liquid has to be greater than the entropy decrease in the surroundings for the net to be positive. Does that make sense to you guys? Is anybody there? Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> okay, so there's got to be a net increase, but it's all entropy. And before we were saying, oh, well, we can track changes in heat. That seems to point us in the right direction for spontaneity, but it's really connected to the entropy loss in the surroundings in this case. So there's a give and take and you got to weigh it and you, the universe weighs this all the time. And it just says, whichever um, direction increases entropy, that's the one I'm going in. And if it absorbs heat and increases entropy, then great. If it gives off heat and increases a net entropy, then that's the way it's going. So you see heat is involved but it's, it's involved in the light of what's happening to entropy. So everything in the universe, as far as spontaneity and the natural occurrence is rooted in the change in entropy. And that's why Stephen Hawkins wrote his book, The Arrow of Time Based Off of Entropy because the universe is unwinding and it always points in the same direction towards increase of entropy. Uh, I never read that book. Um, maybe I should read it uh, one of these days. Uh, any questions on that? All righty. Uh, okay, so Let's um, play around with this equation and see if we can uh, understand it in terms of uh, reactions that we might study in chemistry. Uh, so now I have just this reaction here. I'm gonna make some water from uh, gaseous hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, and I can uh, calculate the Delta S for this reaction, which sometimes we call Delta S of system or delta S of reaction. Now, how can I calculate that? Anybody know? You'll be doing it in the next homework, probably. Sum of the entropy of the products minus the sum of the entropy of the reaction. Awesome. All right. Somebody had their coffee out there. Good. Yeah, so that's how you're going to do that. You're going to use your book values and you're going to calculate the uh, change of entropy of the system. Now let's take a look at the surroundings. So I need to find uh, the change in the entropy in the surroundings. And what do you know? Hey, this is a perfect application for that equation that we just introduced a few plates back because the surroundings is like a big temperature sink, right? So there's lots of available heat energy and I could take a little bit out of the surroundings or I could put a little bit in and the temperature is not going to change. Like if we were in the lecture hall and I uh, blew up something in front of everybody in the class, you'll see the flame and, and 
um, and the, the explosion you'll hear, but you won't uh, experience a change in the temperature of the room. Okay, so this is a perfect situation for applying that equation of Q um, reversible over the temperature because the temperature is pretty much constant for the surroundings in most cases, as long as they're not too extreme. So I need the Q that goes into or out of the, the surroundings over the temperature of the surroundings. I also note that that heat that's taken out of or goes into the surroundings is related to the heat of the system. How much heat does that system need for the process or how much heat is that um, process going to give off? And it's going to be the opposite sign. So uh, this Q surroundings here, uh, doesn't that equal minus Q system? Right, it does. And the Q system under constant pressure conditions, we know equals um, delta H of the system. Okay. So minus Q system equals minus uh, Q, uh, sorry, minus uh, H system. And so that's where we get this term right here. And we can find this term that's equal to minus delta H of the reaction. And we know how to get that because we can apply that same equation that we looked at at the beginning of our uh, discussion. So you can also calculate this. So I take that value, plug it in, make sure I, I don't lose my sign, and I can calculate the delta S of the surroundings just using tabulated book values. Then I can put those together here and here for the system and the surroundings. And you see that when I do that, I get a positive value for uh, delta S of the universe. And um, that tells me that this reaction, uh, according to the second law of thermodynamics, is predicted to be spontaneous. And it's not a surprise that most of the Earth uh, surface has water on it. Any questions uh, about that? All righty. Now, uh, getting to one of the last things that I want to talk about today, because I, I think we're going to break early because this is kind of a, a lot of uh, interesting topics that you should probably think about, sleep on, um, and review. Uh, so what, what this plate talks about is um, how chemists and chemistry uh, gets around uh, looking at the universe and the surroundings and focuses just on the chemical reaction that uh, we're talking about or that's under study. So for this one, we start again with the, the second law of thermodynamics. And we say, all right, well, just like we did before, as long as that surroundings is a big heat sink, and um, uh, T is pretty much constant, then we can use this equation for the surroundings. It would be opposite the heat of the system because any heat that comes out of the system goes to the surroundings or any heat that goes out of the surroundings has to go into the system. So we just make that change of sign and plug that in. And so now 
what we've done in our, uh, our new equation is we got rid of talking about the surroundings and we focus now on the system. Okay. This term is already uh, with the system, so we don't have to worry about it. That leaves us with this one here, delta S of the universe. So what, what's done in, in chemistry to get rid of that term is we multiply through by a minus T and then make a, a new definition. And we define what's called the Gibbs free energy. Delta G for the system equals minus T times the delta S of the universe. Once we make that change, you see this equation down here is a reformation of the second law. But it's in terms of the reaction or the system. So now we don't have to think about anything else but the, the reaction that's taking place, even though it's really uh, a, a bigger picture than just that. Any questions on that? All right, now what, what we're gonna do is take a look at what this Gibbs free energy means, right? We know now that it equals minus T times the delta S of the universe. And, and right off the bat, um, for any process that's spontaneous, right? What does the sign of delta S universe have to be, anybody? greater than zero. Yeah, it has to be positive, right? So that means delta G for a spontaneous process has to be what? Positive. No, it's got to be negative. Check it out. Look, if this is positive, if this term's positive, then delta G has to be negative for a spontaneous process. Do you see that? Yes, sir. Okay, cool. Um, because temperature is never negative. Why? Anybody know why? Because <laughs> it's in Kelvin. <laughs> and Kelvin's never negative. All right. Uh, good. I, I, think, um, I think we're doing good. Uh, so here's a recap of uh, the relationship between delta G, uh, delta H, and delta S. Uh, there's our new uh, equation that's all for the system. And, and so we drop those subscripts usually. Uh, and oftentimes, um, this is for standard conditions. Okay. So this is our reformation of the second law uh, to make it fit uh, more towards chemists liking and focus on the reaction uh, at hand and sweep all the universe and surrounding things under the rug, so to speak. All righty. Now, um, I think I'm going to stop there, stop a little early, and then uh, next time we'll go into uh, looking at why uh, processes that are spontaneous tend to minimize uh, delta G and also make that uh, connection to the equilibrium constant. But I, I think we went through quite a bit uh, so far. So I'm going to uh, stop right there and take any questions. Anybody have any questions can hang out afterwards and uh, uh, we can go over them.